I'm Caleb Benjamin, intern at Lawfare, with an episode from the Lawfare Archive for December 16th, 2023. This past week, several pieces in Lawfare discussed a pair of FISA's Section 702 reauthorization bills the House of Representatives was considering in anticipation of 702's expiration date at the end of this year. However, after debates in the House over how to properly address reauthorization stalled, Congress added an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2024, extending Section 702 authorization until April 2024. Congress has now passed the NDAA, kicking the Section 702 fight down the road for a few months. For today's archive episode, I picked an episode from July 2017, in which Susan Hennessy sat down with Jim Baker and Carl Gaddis to discuss the FBI's perspective on the legal and operational elements of Section 702. The episode aired amid similar debate over Section 702 reauthorization in anticipation of its then-December 2017 expiration date. I'm Susan Hennessy, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, July 29, 2017. Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act is set to sunset on December 31, 2017. For those keeping track, that's less than six months away. The looming question is whether Congress will reauthorize the program as it currently exists, if it will implement changes, or if it will allow Section 702 to lapse altogether. As the legislative debate heats up, I sat down with FBI General Counsel Jim Baker and Executive Assistant Director of the National Security Branch, Carl Gaddis, to discuss the Bureau's views on the legal and operational elements of Section 702. They discuss the program's importance to the FBI's mission, their views on the underlying legality, and the controversial elements related to the handling of U.S. persons' information, and the so-called backdoor search loophole. It's the Lawfare Podcast, Episode 240, Jim Baker and Carl Gaddis of the FBI on Section 702. I'm here today with FBI General Counsel Jim Baker and Executive Assistant Director of the National Security Branch, Carl Gaddis, to discuss the impending reauthorization of FISA Section 702. Most Lawfare Podcast listeners are already basically familiar with the fundamentals of Section 702, but Jim, give us a soundbite explanation. What is it that we're talking about here? Well, thank you, Susan. It's uh, great to see you again, and thanks for this opportunity. Uh, so we're talking about the renewal of a particular provision of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA, known as Section 702, which that's the section of FISA that we're we're referring to here. And it was enacted uh, in 2008. And it is a provision that allows the government to target persons reasonably believed to be located abroad in order to acquire foreign intelligence information based upon a certification or certifications by the Director of National Intelligence and the Attorney General under the supervision of the FISA court, but in a situation where you do not have, the government does not have to go to the FISA court on an individualized basis with respect to each target or each selector. So it's, it's viewed as a, it's, it's, it's a uh, part of the law that sets out a program, a system by which individual targets uh, can be uh, uh, collected on. Uh, but without having to go to the court in each particular instance. It's, it's in contrast to the other more traditional parts of FISA where the government has to go to court uh, in each instance before it can begin collection, before it can do a search, or before it can do uh, electronic surveillance. So that's what we're talking about here. So the law has a sunset provision, so it will expire on December 31st of this year if it's not uh, reauthorized either uh, as it exists now, this is known as a clean reauthorization, or some other form of uh, reauthorization. So this has sort of the effect of a forcing function. There is going to be a debate in the coming six months. One of the things that I think maybe people outside the government have less insight about is what exactly is the FBI's role in this debate, which is primarily occurring within Congress. So what do you view as the agency's role and your individual roles in this debate that's going to be very public? Well, maybe I'll start out and then uh, turn it over to Carl in in a second. But I mean, I guess I would say that... 702 is critically important to the FBI accomplishing its mission. It is critically important to us. Uh, And I'll leave it to Carl to go through some of the examples and explain that a bit more. But it is is we therefore play a role with respect to the program uh, that is consistent with the FBI's overall role in the intelligence community in, in the federal government. 
In other words, that the FBI operates mainly in the United States, and we operate mainly dealing with uh, U.S. persons and persons in the United States, and we're sort of the, the last line of defense, if you will, on a federal level uh, to try to deal with and stop threats that face the country here inside the United States. So we work with our intelligence community partners, we work with our foreign partners, we work with our state and local partners inside the United States to try to accomplish that. But we are a key sort of linchpin, I would say, between the intelligence community, state and local partners, and then we operate ourselves domestically to try to make sure that threats are addressed before something bad can happen. I think it's very important for us to um, have some uh, very good dialogue with uh, folks on the Hill, members and staffers on the Hill with respect to Section 702. Uh, we have been uh, involved in that effort for the last couple of months. We've been on the Hill talking to various committees, and we've also talked to various staffers and so forth. And the dialogue that we have had with them has been focused on why 702 is such a critical part of what we do and how we investigate our cases. Um, and we've been trying to convey to them various examples of how we've used Section 702 to protect the American people. At the same time, we have been uh, having discussions with respect to how we train our personnel to use 702 so that the way they use it is consistent with the standard minimization procedures. And we have also tried to convey a, um, a, uh, an understanding of the oversight that uh, is, is put upon us to ensure that we comply with the law and comply with the standard minimization procedures. So it is that process that we hope gives uh, the members on the Hill a sense of comfort that we are good stewards of this law um, and that it is a critical part of how we uphold the Constitution and protect the American people. Um, so our interaction with them has been very critical, uh, and I expect that it will be ongoing through the course of this year. Talk us through that a little bit. Um, why is Section 702 so valuable to the FBI specifically? We hear a lot about other agencies' use of it. This message that you're carrying to the Hill, it's a critically important program. Um, you know, why, is it, why is it important, and why is it important specifically for the FBI? Section 702 allows us to do many different things. First, uh, as, as Jim indicated, Section 702 coverage applies to foreign people located overseas. Uh, the FBI uses 702 a little bit differently than the rest of the intelligence community. We receive a very small percentage of NSA's collection. In order to um, further target that collection, we use it only with respect to our full investigations, and those are the investigations that require the highest level of authorization within the organization. Um, so a full investigation requires an articulable factual basis that a crime has been committed or there's a threat to national security. Our collection can only be uh, given to us, we can only have access to that collection if a, a, an individual target is relevant to that particular full investigation. So when you look at the overall collection that NSA has, we have a very small percentage of that. And then an even smaller percentage is reviewed by us because that's what's limited to our full investigations. We use that information to try to identify whether or not individuals overseas who are foreign-born are plotting or planning attacks against the United States or against American interests overseas. Incidentally, we often identify those foreign individuals overseas in that collection who are talking to people located in the United States about attack planning here, CONUS. So it's very important for us in trying to protect the United States and protect the American people to identify individuals overseas, to identify their networks, and to identify the individuals they're talking to here in the United States, and to determine what they're plotting, what their planning is, and what their preparation is in terms of attacks here in the United States. Can I just amplify on that? So it's, it's all about connecting the dots, both for us and for the intelligence community. And so one of the things that 702 helps us do is to connect the dots. And, and we have been very conscious and very thoughtful about making sure that we're doing everything we can to connect what we learn through 702 with the other information that we have in our, in our possession. So what do I mean by that? Post 9-11, you know, one, of the, one of the key problems uh, that I, was identified by the 9-11 Commission was the government's, generally the government's, uh, failure to connect dots. And this was also something that was uh, pointed out with respect to the uh, <clears throat> attack at Fort Hood, that the FBI did not have, uh, did not construct its databases in a way to enable it 
enable us to look across those databases quickly to find out what links there were involving a particular subject or set of subjects and so on. And so what we have tried to do since then and have been successful at doing is putting our databases in a con – constructing them, architecting them in a certain way so that when an analyst or an agent obtains information with respect to a threat of some sort, an investigation, at the very earliest stages of the investigation, that's what's important to remember, at, at the very earliest stages when you're just getting limited information, you really don't know exactly what's going on, you're trying to sort that out, that an analyst or an agent can sit down and do one database check using a piece of information, a name, an email address, a phone number, things like that, and that the agent in particular with respect to agents working on uh, national security cases, will be able to look across all of those databases and see what information there is pertaining to that particular uh, term, that database check term, and then pull the information back and quickly assess it to sort out what's important from what's not important, to, to focus very limited, we have very limited investigative resources uh, that need to be deployed smartly, and so we try to do that. and, and having these federated databases, having these, these queries, these database checks that can look across all these databases one, at one time and then also see what there is in the 702 um, collection stream, if you will, pull that all together and enable the analyst to figure out what to do next. That's, what's, that's what this really is all about at the end of the day, to try to enable us to act quickly with respect to the threats that are, that are facing us. So, Jim, when you talk about databases, what are you actually talking about? Well, so we're talking about a number of different databases that the FBI has that include materials, information, data, communications, communications-related data, metadata, that the FBI has obtained lawfully through a variety of different mechanisms under a variety of different authorities that we already have, that we've already met the requirements of the statute if it applies to a particular set of data, with respect to the Fourth Amendment, it in will include FISA information that's been obtained pursuant to other parts of FISA, for example. And so it, it all goes, in, it goes into a series of databases that agents and analysts, analysts can search in using one term that will go through all of the databases and look for relevant information. In particular, with respect to 702, this means that we are looking at data communications that we have already obtained and that we have, uh, as Carl was saying earlier, uh, met the requirements of the statute, met the requirements um, that we have to set forth under the uh, targeting procedures, standard minimization procedures. It is not about going out and doing new collection. That's an important thing to understand about this. When, when we do one of these database checks or a query, we are simply checking the material, the communications that we already have. It's not initiating something new. It's not going out into the wild, so to speak, and pulling in new communications or going to another agency and pulling in communications. It's, it's reviewing communications with respect to which we already have a full investigation and looking at those communications that we lawfully have obtained pursuant to 702 as it exists today. We've been talking about foreign individuals, and this, the targeting of this program is all in that foreign intelligence space. Some of the most persistent concerns and critiques of this program are related to U.S. persons' information. So walk me through whether or not you think those are misconceptions, you know, or, or are there valid concerns about the way the Bureau interacts with U.S. persons' information? As many folks from the FBI have said repeatedly, the FBI's mission is to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution. And we take a back seat to no one with respect to doing both of those simultaneously. We want to accomplish both of those objectives at the same time. That means uh, protecting people's rights under the Fourth Amendment, and that means protecting people's uh, constitutional rights to privacy. So we want to make sure that we do that. So. Uh, what we believe and what every body to have looked at this issue, uh, you know, courts and the, and the uh, PCLOD, the President's Civil Liberties uh, Oversight Board, every entity that has looked at 702 has determined that it is constitutional because it contains reasonable, it, it, it is reasonable, and it contains appropriate protections for the privacy of Americans. And so we want to make sure that, that the, those rights are protected 
and that at the same time we can operate in the way that Carl and I have been talking about in terms of being able to act quickly, to be able to connect the dots, to do all that simultaneously. And so we think that the, that 702 contains those kinds of uh, provisions that enable us to protect privacy adequately. It's important also to note from, from the perspective of an investigator or an analyst, when they get a lead or when they get a piece of information, uh, two things. They may not know whether a particular selector that they are reviewing um, is owned by or associated with an American person. Secondly, that, the answer to that question may not even be relevant. What that person is trying to do is determine whether there is a threat associated with this particular issue, uh, whether it's, a, it's a, an email address, a telephone number, a license plate, whatever the case may be. Um, it's irrelevant at that early portion of the investigation whether the person associated with that particular selector, as we call it, is a U.S. person or not. What is relevant is, is that selector associated with someone who poses a threat to our national security? And the key is to try to answer that question in the least intrusive manner possible and as quickly as possible so that we can mitigate the threat. Given the way the threat posture is here in the United States, the amount of time it takes for an actor to decide to act is very short. We no longer are faced with long, drawn-out, vetted plots here in the United States. We're faced with homegrown violent extremists who have access to the Internet, who can act instantly, who can be inspired by ISIS, for example, could potentially be uh, directed or enabled by ISIS, but their ability to act is only dependent upon a desire to do so and access to a gun or a knife or a car. For us to determine whether that individual poses a threat becomes increasingly more important to do in a, in, a, in a quick manner so that we can mitigate that threat as quickly as possible. So hundreds of times a day, we have analysts and, uh, and agents all across the country who come upon selectors, like I've described, and who check those selectors in our databases to, de to determine what we already know, what we already have in our holdings that may help them answer the question about whether this selector is associated with an individual that poses a threat. One of the most controversial elements of the program is known as the backdoor search loophole. A lot of the debate centers around this specific issue. What is the backdoor search loophole and, and how do you think about it? Well, so if I'll, I'll give it a shot to try to explain what the argument is. So the, I think the argument is that, well, this program, 702 as I described, enables the government to collect to target people outside the United States to acquire foreign intelligence. And inevitably, when you're doing that, th those people are going to be in communication with U.S. persons and people in the United States, and that information is going to be end up in government databases. The government's going to obtain that. Well, the government did not, in the first instance, get a warrant because it didn't have to under this part of the statute, so it didn't get a warrant to obtain these communications. Those communications end up in the government's databases, and then when, when the government starts to do these database checks or queries, as, as Carl and I have described, the government is doing that without, it's doing it consistent with FBI policies, procedures, attorney general guidelines, but it's doing it without obtaining a warrant in the first instance. So the argument is that, well, that's a backdoor search because in essence what you're doing is you're searching the email, let's say, or other communications of Americans in a situation where you never had to go to court to obtain a warrant in the first place. And so that's, that's what the backdoor search argument is. I think our concern, we have multiple concerns with, with thinking about that, um, or that, that argument, that line of argument. I think, first of all, th let me back up. Again, the, the key thing is, as the FISA Court of Review said in 2002 with respect to f the older, the more traditional parts of FISA, f the searches that FISA authorizes are constitutional because they are reasonable. And so what we have here, we think, under 702 is a reasonable regime that meets the requirements of the Fourth Amendment. It is known, it was known by Congress, and it is known now, that this is what happens, that it, incidentally, it's inevitable that we're going to collect some amount of U.S. person communications. But the idea is that given all of the structure that is built into 702 with, first of all, a statutory uh, structure enacted by Congress, passed by Congress, with certain terms and conditions put upon the executive branch, with a significant amount of 
oversight and review by the FISA court and approval of the procedures that we use with a significant amount of uh, review and oversight by the Department of Justice, by Congress, by inspectors general, uh, that all of this together creates a regime that is reasonable and that therefore provides adequate privacy protections for the legitimate Fourth Amendment rights of Americans and that the added requirement of a warrant before the government, the FBI, could do one of these database checks that Carl was describing uh, would simply, it's simply just not required. It is, it, it could be added in theory, but it is not required by the Fourth Amendment in order to make this program reasonable. Uh, it sounds like a reasonable rejoinder um, to just sort of say, look, the, the FBI gets a warrant in all kinds of circumstances. It gets a warrant under Title I of FISA. It's U.S. person's information. Just add in a warrant requirement that this, um, uh, it seems even common sense, I think, to, you know, on a certain line of argument. Um, you've spoken a little bit about there being a disconnect between the logic of the argument and how it might be implemented in practice. Um, so if there is a warrant requirement, um, does that, you know, is that not a, a huge burden? How does that actually impact the operational equities as you see them? Yeah, a warrant requirement would uh, have a significantly negative impact on our operations with respect to section, section 702. As I said, um, we have to make sure that we balance uh, the privacy and civil li liberties rights with protecting the American people. As I indicated, the threat is, is rapidly evolving here in the United States right now. So it's imperative that we assess initial information as quickly as we can to mitigate the threat. If we were required to, have, to uh, get a search warrant every time we conducted a database check, that attempt to identify threat information would be slowed down exponentially. So in, in the uh, instance I described earlier where an agent or analyst would take a selector and conduct a database check of that uh, particular selector in our holdings, uh, that agent or analyst would now have to stop their search and develop probable cause that would then be put in an affidavit. Developing probable cause at that early stage of an investigation would be uh, very difficult to do. Oftentimes, we don't know to whom that handle is associated. We don't have any other derogatory information other than the lead or the tip that we may have gotten from an American citizen or another agency or a foreign service. We have very little information about that particular selector. And as I said before, we don't even know if that selector is associated with an American person. So we would have to stop that work and develop probable cause. So the agent or analyst would have to get together with an assistant U.S. attorney, work on developing probable cause. If probable cause could be developed, that information would have to be put into an affidavit. Then the agent would have to take that affidavit, go before a magistrate, swear out that affidavit, swear out the warrant, come back with the warrant, and then be able to search holdings that we already have. By that time, the threat could have progressed beyond the point where we would be able to mitigate the threat. So in terms of us being able to keep up with the rapid evolution of the threat, it would have a significant impact on our ability to do so. Yeah, so if I could just amplify a bit on that. So again, this is these checks that we're doing are things that we do at the outset of an investigation. We're checking the holdings that we've already obtained lawfully through a variety of different means. And so if we can't do that, it makes it extremely, well, it would make it extremely difficult for us to build the probable cause that, that Carl was just talking about. The reality is, here's, here's one of the things that I'm concerned about. If 702 took on this special status that before we could touch it, we had to have probable cause and go get a warrant, then we would have to figure out a different way to construct our databases, I think, because these database checks are so fun fundamental. It's the bread and butter of what we do in terms of uh, conducting investigations at the outset that we would have to probably figure out a way to segregate 702 in some way so that these database queries, these database checks could continue the way that, that Carl was describing, but perhaps they wouldn't touch 702. So we, 702 would have a separate status. It would sit, it would have to sit off to the side separately. And then if agents, analysts wanted to look at it to, by doing some type of query, they would have to go through a separate mechanism to do so. Now, some people might say, that's great, that's what we want, because we're concerned about the, uh, the privacy implications of all this, the backdoor search issue that, that you and I just talked about. But what folks have to, to think about is the risk 
to the country that would be associated with that. And because there is a, an increased likelihood that if we had to segregate this data, that we would miss dots. We would, we would not connect things that we otherwise would connect and that we feel pretty confident that we would be able to connect. Um, and so it's a, it's a risk, you know, benefit assessment that we'd, we'd have to go through. I mean, let me just make this point at this, at, at this juncture. Look, at the end of the day, the FBI works for the American people. We're the servants of the American people, and we use the tools that Congress gives us to conduct our investigations under whatever terms and conditions Congress thinks is appropriate. But we just want to make sure that folks understand that as they're debating this for the, for the rest of the year and as they're thinking about this, we have to really think about what the benefit is to the country, to the privacy rights of Americans, by adding a warrant requirement with respect to the cost that that would potentially impose of making us less able to connect dots when for 16 years now people have been telling us how critically important it is to connect those dots in order to protect the country. So we've all been talking about the, the terrorism context, you know, this, this evolving threat in which time is of the essence. There's another account that I think we hear a lot sort of from, from the civil liberties community, and that's that this information is collected for this special purpose. Yes, there is this very important need, but it's really being searched for tax evasion and drug crimes and for all sorts of other, uh, other uses that are fundamentally unrelated. Is that a fair charge? Or is, does that fail to comprehend something about the databases or the laws? Or, or is that just the, the way in which the law actually functions here? Given how seriously we take 702, um, we would not do anything to jeopardize um, our use of it or violate either the standard minimization procedures or Section 702 itself. Um, if the analogy I would make is, if you if you look at, for example, a uh, an organized crime um, scenario, organized crime case, if you have a uh, critical source who is uh, targeting an organized crime syndicate, you are not going to expose that source in court just for a street level drug conviction. You're going to use that source to target, identify charge and convict the top echelon of that organized crime syndicate. Similarly, this tool is so valuable for us that we would not risk its exposure um, or exposing it to weakness or uh, violation of any of the SMPs or, or uh, any of the uh, oversight procedures by using it on something uh, that, that was not uh, uh, of critical national security importance to us. So we guard, we guard it very closely. Um, and along the lines of, you know, I mentioned oversight a number of times. There is a significant amount of oversight that goes into how we use Section 702. Um, we have oversight internally from our internal attorneys, uh, constantly making sure that we do not violate the standard minimization procedures. We have oversight from the Department of Justice. Uh, we have oversight from the uh, Director of National Intelligence. We also have oversight from the various committees on the Hill. Uh, and the entire program was also reviewed by the PCLOB, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board that, that Jim mentioned. So a number of folks outside of this organization are watching us very closely and making sure that we use this particular tool the way uh, it's intended to be used. And we welcome that oversight as well. And all that oversight is effective. It, it, we make mistakes. And the internal uh, reviews that we do, the, the reviews that the Department of Justice does, uh, Congress, the court, everyone else involved in this process, as Carl was saying, we, f we find problems. And we, but, the, but the point is that there is a robust, meaningful, real oversight regime that exists here that finds things, that brings them to light, that puts them in front of the FISA court and enables the court to assess whether or not the, notwithstanding those, those mistakes that are made, uh, whether the program still is, is constitutional still meets the requirements of the statute. And what the FISA court has found recently is, uh, as this year, and, and made a statement to the effect, something along the lines of what, what the statute and what the Constitution require is that the program is reasonable, not that it's perfect. And so these oversight mechanisms find mistakes, 
which is good. It means that these folks are actually doing their jobs and working. We address the mistakes. We try to figure out what the root cause was, fix the problem, move on, continue to do the oversight. But that at the end of the day, the FISA court concluded, for example, that notwithstanding all of this, the program is still being off- operated in a lawful constitutional way and that it's reasonable at the end, at the end of the day. So one of the things we've, we've even seen members of Congress ask is why there can't be more metrics or numbers delivered, right? So why can't you say the amount of times there's U.S. person queries and there's sort of there's different metrics? This has uh, really been a source of tension between the NSA and its overseers, between the Bureau and its overseers. You know, are you able to talk about why producing those numbers might be difficult or, or why that seems to have emerged as an issue? It's, it's very difficult to put a number to the amount of times each day, for instance, that a database check is conducted. As Jim said early on, we encourage our analysts and agents, we train our analysts and agents to look through our databases in an attempt to connect the dots. So if they have a selector, they are taught at the outset that is the first thing you do, determine what information we already have in our own holdings about that particular selector. Uh, We see it as a basic investigative technique. We see it as a way to live up to the expectations of the American people in that they want us to connect the dots. If something were to happen and we had information in our own holdings that we did not uncover because we did not conduct a particular database check, then the American people, rightly so, uh, would be very disappointed with us and very furious that we were not able to do that. So that is a very basic investigative technique that we use, and it is used, as I said before, literally hundreds of times a day. So it would be very difficult to quantify that. With respect to the the selectors themselves, as I said before, we don't always know whether that particular selector is associated with a, a U.S. person or not. In order to figure out if it is, we would have to take far more intrusive measures to determine the answer to that question than we would if we were just to run it against our database and more often than not come back with a negative response and then move along. In order to develop probable cause for a search warrant, we would have to take far more intrusive measures to try to determine who owns that particular email address or that license plate number or whatever the case may be. Early on in our investigation, we try to figure out as much information as we can in the most in the least intrusive fashion that we can employ. So in, in trying to determine whether someone is a U.S. person or not, we would have to take additional steps that would be far more intrusive than running a database check. And so, so that's the impact that we are trying to convey to the staffers on the Hill, the members on the Hill, so they have a, a better understanding of why we are taking the position we are with respect to search warrants and so forth. So one thing that was a feature of the Section 215 metadata reauthorization that ultimately resulted in the passage of the USA Freedom Act was sort of a charge that the government wasn't able to show precisely where, where the value was. They, they didn't have the dramatic cases in which, but for this particular program, they would have stopped an attack. There was some sort of benefit. 702 is a, is a really rather different program than, uh, than 215. And the government has taken steps to, to rather unusual steps really to declassify use case examples. Um, Carl, you've talked about those a little bit in, uh, in your Senate testimony. Um, so, you know, what are those examples that you think really do demonstrate the way the program's used and, and its value? Sure. I can, I can give you a couple of examples of how we've used 702 to identify uh, foreign persons overseas who are trying to either recruit uh, or radicalize folks here in the United States. And also an example uh, in which Section 702 helped us identify an attacker overseas and helped us provide information to a foreign government to apprehend that attacker. Uh, The first example involves an individual by the name of Sean Parson. Uh, This was an individual who uh, we opened a case on back in October of 2013. Um, He was a foreign person located overseas. In this this case, he lived in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Ultimately, he uh, developed a significant amount of contacts with an ISIS network. And he ended up moving to Syria. While he was in Syria, he engaged in contact with individuals all across the world, trying to recruit them, entice them uh, to come work for ISIS, to come fight for ISIS. So he was a a recruiter, among other things. Um, Additionally, he also 
uh, began identifying military personnel in the United States and publishing their personal identifying information online and encouraging people in the United States to target uh, these military personnel. So he was uh, recruiting, he was spreading the ISIS ideology, um, and he was also providing, essentially targeting information for those individuals who would be uh, susceptible to the um, ISIS ideology. Uh, he was very effective at, at doing this. He was an English speaker. Uh, he was very skilled working with social media. He uh, did ISIS recruiting videos and posted them online, and he had a vast network of associates online. Our Section 702 coverage helped us uh, uncover all of this. Our Section 702 coverage also helped us uh, take this information that we uh, discovered and provide it to foreign services so they too could build out the networks in their own countries. So it was very valuable in terms of identifying a very significant ISIS recruiter and facilitator overseas. Ultimately, he, uh, as I said, he had moved to Syria and was ultimately killed uh, in Syria in 2015. So uh, very valuable tool uh, in helping us mitigate that threat. The other example I alluded to involved a shooting at a Turkish nightclub uh, on New Year's Eve of last year, 2016. Uh, as you know, a particular individual entered this nightclub, um, conducted a, an attack in that nightclub using a gun, killed a number of people, and injured an American citizen. Uh, the American citizen was shot in, in the hip. The uh, attacker ultimately got away. But uh, we were able to, from the, the foreign government, obtain a, a selector that was associated with him, and we went up on 702 coverage on that particular individual. And using that coverage, we were able to identify his location and pass that location along to the Turkish government. And using that information, the Turkish government was able to apprehend him. Without that uh, information, that locational information, they would not have been able to find him, and he could have potentially conducted additional attacks. Yeah, I would just add, just to amplify a little bit what Carl's saying, and as you hear the examples, it's just important to remember that 702, like the rest of FISA, 702 is an investigative tool. It's not an investigation itself, right? So it is one of the multiple things that we, that we use, database checks, uh, national security letters, subpoenas, interactions with foreign partners, uh, sharing of information within the intelligence community. We do a whole bunch of stuff to try to deal with the th various threats that we face. 702 is one of those tools that we use. We try to use it appropriately and lawfully and where it makes sense and to connect dots and so on and so forth as we've been talking about today. But it's, it's linked to, you can't just view it in isolation. When you're thinking about its value, you have to think about it as part of a whole, a, a, a whole suite of uh, investigative tools that we use, and it fills a, a critical uh, gap that would otherwise exist if you didn't have that tool. There are, would be other ways we could try to do it. There's a history to 702. There were things that were done before that. Uh, they were very, uh, they were effective, but they were labor intensive as well and consumed a lot of resources. And so this is where the, the country just has to make a choice about how it wants to deploy its resources in light of the different objectives that we're trying to achieve, both in terms of protecting the country and upholding the Constitution. So as we head into sort of the finish line of the 702 reauthorization debate or, or the second half of the year, what is it that you really wish people took away and understood uh, about this program and about the way the FBI uses it? I would say that Section 702 provides us the lawful agility that we need to keep up with the threat. It allows us insight into what foreign persons overseas are doing in terms of plotting and planning to attack the United States. It also gives us insight into who those individuals who are located overseas are talking to uh, about attacking the United States. They might be talking to folks in the United States. They might be talking to folks elsewhere in the world. But it gives us insight into attack planning. And given the rapid evolution of the threat, it allows us uh, the agility to be able to devise mitigation plans to take those threats head on. And without that tool, the national security of the American people is going to be extremely negatively impacted. Uh, it's also worth noting that, as I said earlier, there are a number of layers of oversight to ensure that we comply with Section 702, uh, the Fourth Amendment, um, and our, uh, our, our desire to uphold the Constitution. Yeah, and just to pick up on that, I mean, I think one of the most important things, I think, 
for people to understand is that this that that 702 is constitutional and it's constitutional because it is reasonable under the Fourth Amendment. And it's reasonable under the Fourth Amendment for a number of reasons. You've got, first of all, a, a congressionally approved structure. It is a legal structure set forth by Congress to regulate the executive branch's activities in this regard. It has clear definitions set forth throughout the, uh, throughout the statute. You have requirements that you can, as Carl was saying, you can only target foreign persons reasonably believed to be outside the United States. To, to acquire foreign intelligence information. It's not just for any purpose. It's for foreign intelligence information. You have accountable officials, the Director of National Intelligence and the Attorney General, who must certify on an annual basis that this is for those purposes. You have the, the statute The statute requires that there be a set of procedures, targeting procedures, minimization procedures, that have to meet specific uh, definitions set forth in the statute. And that at the end of the day, then, the FISA court has to look at all of that, has to look at and review all of the things, uh, all of the provisions uh, of the statute and make sure that, that the government's implementation of 702 meets all of those requirements. So you've got all that review. And then you have reporting to Congress and oversight by Congress. Uh, you have this whole, when you're thinking about the constitutionality of 702, you have to think of the whole structure that exists and all of the different players that, that uh, have a role with respect to making sure that it's implemented appropriately. Uh, and that at the end of the day, this structure, as I said earlier, every, every outside body that's looked at this has determined that this structure is constitutional. It meets the requirements of the Fourth Amendment. Jim Baker and Carl Gaddis, thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you. Our pleasure. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. As ever, our music is performed by Sophia Yan. If you haven't already, please support the podcast by spreading the word and giving us a rating and review in the iTunes store. As always, thanks for listening.